Posso agora apresentar os intervenientes no primeiro painel do dia, denominado Mundo Global de Oportunidades, parte 1, onde estarão em debate os temas dos novos talentos e os novos consumidores. Neste painel contamos com a intervenção do professor Albert Aldrich, Professor and Department Chair, Sociology, and Professor of Management in the Keenan Flagler Business School, the University of North Carolina, USA. Seguidamente, contaremos com as intervenções do Dr. Pedro Caramês, do engenheiro Humberto Aires Pereira, da Farmativa, do Dr. Vasco Marques, do Portal do Sucesso, e ainda do engenheiro Nuno Miller, da Farfest.com, moderadas pelo Dr. Manuel Forjas. Vamos então ouvir as intervenções do professor Howard Aldrich. I'm delighted to join you today. This is my first visit to Portugal. I've been to Europe many times, had many visiting appointments, but never had an opportunity to visit your lovely country. And I'm very much enjoying the hospitality <laughs> I'm receiving here, and especially from the people at the university. When I was asked to do a keynote address today, the, uh, the issue really for me was how to get you to think about entrepreneurship in a perhaps different way than you might normally. And so what I've done is to prevent, present a, an argument about the way we, should, we could conceptualize the dynamics of entrepreneurship, and conceptualize the challenges that face not only entrepreneurs, but also governments that are trying to encourage entrepreneurship. Now we've heard already today the point about entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, and jobs. I'll make a special point of that in my presentation. I know it seems strange in a session devoted to building and construction to talk about destruction, but I want to emphasize this for a reason. Entrepreneurship from the point of view of individuals, could be seen as the creation and the pursuit of opportunities. But from the point of view of the economy, it's also about destruction. It's about destruction at the level of firms, the fact that many of the people trying to start businesses don't succeed. It's about destruction at the level of new industries and new populations, which is that populations of industries, new industries, come and go more quickly than we might imagine. And most importantly, at the community or societal level, it's about the adding and taking away of jobs as firms come and go and populations of uh, industries come and go. So let's start with the, uh, the beginning, start with the creation of new ventures. Now, I've shown you here a tongue-in-cheek picture. Of course, not every entrepreneur takes this tumble. But it is true that we know from our studies, most of the people who begin the attempt to organize a business don't carry through on it. After about two years of trying to organize, about half of the people give up. After about five years, maybe one in five actually succeed in creating a cash flow positive business. It's a very daunting challenge. Many people aren't up to it. And it's not necessarily because of individual capabilities or competencies. As I'll talk about later, much of this has to do with the kind of opportunity structure, the environment in which people are trying to insert themselves with their new venture. To give you some idea of just how daunting the challenge, this is a picture based on my research on representative national samples in the United States. And you see in this picture, beginning at the first month and then continuing out through about, uh, about five years, you see the likelihood of exiting. And you can see the likelihood of exiting is very high initially. We know that in the first few months of a startup attempt, many people just stop. They give up. And that possibility, that, uh, exit probability does gradually drop. The more months people stay with it, the lower and lower the likelihood of exit. In fact, eventually it's, it's uh, not such a bad proposition. But the early days are very difficult. Now this means that the opportunities for educational programs, interventions, training, 
support health. This means that that's critical to occur in the early days. Those interventions can make a huge difference early on. Imagine the difference between half of those people not surviving and, and three quarters of them not surviving. So we know that it's critical to get information and support and resources to entrepreneurs in their early days. Firms that have been around for a while in their later years are in need of this. It's the startups that are desperately in need of this support. For example, we see here a very simple distinction between the survival of those businesses that manage to become uh, registered with the government, that perhaps create a incorporation papers, and those that don't. And the difference between the green line and the blue line is a substantial difference. You can see of those that were uh, registered after about uh, 90 months, almost 50% of them are still alive. In contrast, those that didn't after about uh, 80 months, only 15% are still alive. So there are steps, there are things that entrepreneurs can do in the organizing process to somewhat insulate themselves against this, what we call the liability of newness. So that's the first takeaway point I want to leave you with. Again, excuse the dramatic imagery. Uh, I thought the Grim Reaper, those of you who are entrepreneurs, of course, have stared the Grim Reaper in the face. And if you're still in, in business, you've stared down the Grim Reaper. By contrast, those of you, perhaps on your second startup attempt or third startup attempt, not only faced the Grim Reaper, but succumbed. And it's no shame in that. As I showed you in these first slides, in the United States, we expect people not to make it through this necessarily. We expect, we know this is a great challenge. One of the issues are, that remains is, if you think about this from the point of view, again, of education and support, in these early days, during the, when the liability of business is so high, one of the challenges young entrepreneurs face is, can they learn fast enough to outrun the Grim Reaper, in a sense, in a context in which there are huge challenges, in which there are huge competitive pressures difficulties in, in raising funding, in attracting customers, attracting, uh, making sure you meet various regulatory requirements. Can the new entrepreneurs learn quickly enough to deal with each of those before they succumb to the liability of newness? And so again, it's very important that that foundation be laid properly. The foundation be there for subsequent learning if the business is to survive. So two big challenges. Learning quickly enough to overcome the liability of newness and establishing a stable business platform that lets the business survive in the next stage. Now let me turn to the second big uh, level here. We've been talking about individual entrepreneurs, but when governments are interested, governments become uh, involved, they are concerned with new industries. And that was, I think, the point our two previous speakers made. Uh, particularly in Europe today, people are enamored of the notion of high technology, knowledge-based or science-based startups. And the idea is not simply to create a one-off of something. Right? There's not much profit to this. The idea is that these new firms will be the beginning of a new industry. Five, 10, 100, 200, whatever it might be, of the same kind of business, create an industry, create a community, an infrastructure. That's where the ultimate growth would come from. And here I've mentioned, uh, clearly this is happening all the time, we just ran in seeds. Innovation as a basis for this is what universities and scientific institutes are trying to do. And then, of course, there's a great deal of borrowing across national borders. It's often difficult when you're down in the, on the ground or in the weeds, fighting the battles over the survival of individual firms, to recognize 
that over time, populations or industries come and go. If you take a long enough perspective, years, decades, centuries, our studies show that every population eventually disappears, almost every population. We have a few examples like the church and the army, but beyond those two, most populations disappear. Let me show you some examples of this. Here's uh, two populations you're familiar with. One of them is U.S. auto manufacturers. At one time in the United States, there were hundreds and hundreds of auto manufacturing firms. And you can see in that red line, that number fell swiftly through the 1920s and 30s. By 1940s, there were a few dozen. And then until uh, the Japanese automakers began coming to the U.S., that number drops still further. By contrast, that blue line shows you the disk drive manufacturing industry in the United States. An industry that grew very slowly and then took off in the 1980s. This is a typical pattern. Here, here's uh, one of my favorite examples. My students love this. Horseshoes. Right, from the perspective of the 21st century, it's anachronistic, horseshoes. But of course, just like everything else, buggies, wheels, reins, whips, horseshoes, horseshoe caulk, the thing that you put on the horseshoe to hold the horseshoe on, the nails you drive under the horseshoe, all these things were new at one time. Right? Now, if you look at the streets of Oporto, I, I, I didn't see any horses yesterday. Now, of course, people from the 19th century looking forward would be quite surprised to look at us and see the same, see it's not around anymore, but we have to recognize that it's all a matter of time and perspective, historical understanding. In this case, this industry, although today we think of horses as uh, sort of uh, uh, local color, featureless, at one time, through the 19th century, horses were critical. You looked at cities, you look at American cities in the 1870s and 1880s, all the carriage, all the transportation locally was done by horses. And so we see here, Horses, these are patents, horses, horseshoe cults. If you were funding innovation, you weren't funding innovation of genetics or a, a bi a biotech. You were funding innovation to make better horseshoes, better horseshoe cult. But eventually, around the turn of the century, in fact, very quickly, as the government, as the gasoline powered automobiles uh, came into use, horses disappeared from the streets. So I guess the question is are, are you working here? On the, on the scale of horseshoes and, and the horseshoe call, are we working on the scale of, of, of disc drives? How long is it going to take? One more example, New York City credit unions. Here you see, uh, this is over decades, over a period of about seven decades. This is a very typical pattern when we look at new industries. But we have a tremendous variability. Some industries start, and then for whatever reason, quickly disappear. So other industries start, build gradually, and, and eventually over many, many years uh, achieve stability. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, it's very critical for you to understand where in the cycle of the industry you are coming in. What I think the conference organizers here sure have in mind today, they would like you, they would like to figure out where, how to get people into this early period. How do, how do you, attract entrepreneurs at the stage in which the population is beginning to grow, not bring them into industries that are decades along where there's, there's, been, there's been a very stable uh, template adopted and the competitive competition is much greater at that point. You want to get in early. So the question for policymakers and the institutes and agencies can we spot the emerging industries? Can we move them along? Can we facilitate the growth of those industries that have a long life and identify those perhaps that won't be so fortunate? Now, I'm going to turn to the level that I think has the most policy relevance to uh, Portugal today, which is jobs and job creation and the role of entrepreneurship. I made a distinction here on the slide, you see, between startups, autonomous startups and startups that are sponsored, that is, startups that are 
new firms that are created by firms that already exist. We know from our research that about three quarters, about three quarters of all the new firms in the United States are autonomous. About a quarter of the firms actually are subsidiary, are, are, are startups sponsored by subsidiaries of or otherwise wholly owned units from another firm, but about three quarters of them are autonomous. We also know, looking at job creation, that existing firms have the possibility of growing basically two ways. They can either grow organically by adding people in, in, from retained earnings, or they can grow by mergers and acquisitions. That is, they can gobble up in a predator-prey kind of relationship other, other firms. I'm going to show you some surprising statistics, I believe, about the dynamics of this process. This is some information based in, from uh, the United States in the year 2008. Now, if you remember the year 2008, that was just when the economic crisis was beginning to crystallize. And it was becoming clear that the growth the U.S. economy had been enjoying was beginning to, to, to fray, it was beginning to come undone. This is a very instructive set of data. What we have here, based on government records, these are all the firms in the United States with at least one employee. Right? All the firms in the United States with at least one employee. We have them classified into four categories. On the left, you see all the firms that were opened for the first time in 2008, and it's listed by quarter. So down the side here, January to March, April to May, and so forth, through the four quarters. This is openings. And on average, when a new business opened, about four employees, on average, were added to the labor force. So each opening firm added about four people to the labor force. Notice the quantities involved here. We're not talking hundreds of firms. We're not talking thousands of firms. We're not talking tens of thousands. We're talking hundreds of thousands of firms added in each of these quarters. Making a total for the year of 2008 of 1.4 million openings. Each of these openings on average with four employees. Do the math. Four times 1.4 million. That's the number of new jobs added by opening firms. The next column shows the closings. Now the closings on average took out of the economy a little less than four, 3.7 jobs, something like that. So every closing, that's a firm that disappears, every closing removes jobs from the economy. And what do we see here? Again, not hundreds, not thousands, not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of firms closing. That first quarter, 380,000 firms, each one taking with it three employees close. 391 and so forth. So over the course of the year, 1.5 or 1.6 roughly million firms close. Multiply 1.6 by three. Just look down the two columns. Compare the numbers on the left and the right in those columns. What do you see? The numbers on the, in the right column for closings in every case are larger than the numbers on the left side. Now, even though the closings take out, on average, fewer people than an opening adds, because there are more of them, the net result is not good. So over the course of the year, many millions of jobs lost. So if you look at this from the point of view of intervention, you might say, ah, it's pretty bad. But you realize, of course, this is just this is the way capitalist economies work. In a capitalist economy, you need openings, you need closings. That's the dynamism of the economy. It's the new firms, some of these new technologies, some of these opening up new markets, some of these doing things that were never done before. It has to be space for them. The space they make inevitably leads to some of those businesses that were already in existence exiting. Now we come to the really important difference between 
the, 19th, the 21st century and the 20th century in the next two columns. What these show in the expansions column, these are existing firms that added people. And in the last column, these are contractions, these are firms that shrunk. You can see these numbers are much bigger. This is, of course, the base is much larger. There are millions, of, there are about uh, eight and a half million at the beginning of the year, about eight and a half million businesses with at least one employee. About eight and a half million. So you see in the first quarter, 1.5 million firms. Um, remember, this is 2008. 1.5 million firms still added jobs. Even at the end of the year, in the fourth quarter of 2008, when the economy was clearly on the rocks, 1.37, almost 1.4 million firms were still adding jobs. They were still adding employees to their workforce. But what about their companions? What about their peers? Well, look down the last column, contractions. At the beginning of the year, about 1.6 million were sh had shrunk in that first quarter. That is, they lost at least one and maybe more employees. By the last quarter, the fourth quarter, it was 1.6 million had lost, or had lost jobs in that quarter. So now we see at the bottom of the screen the true story of the recession. Yes, 5.8 million were expanding. That's an amazing number, right? They, they, and they, during the course of the year, they added at least one person. But 6.2 million during the course of the year, one quarter at least, had shrunk. And if you look at 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, what we see is in every year, sort of a similar balance. More closings than openings, more contractions than expansions. Only in the last six months in the United States has the tide turned. Now in the United States, the economy is again adding jobs, which means more openings than closings, more expansions than contractions. This is the story of an economy that's robust and resilient in some respects. This is a, a, a capitalist economy, working the way capitalist economies work, which is firms are born, firms die, firms expand, and firms contract. It's, it's not a, a, an occasion for sorrow to recognize that firms contract and firms close if we recognize at the same time this is being balanced off by firms opening and expanding. We should celebrate that aspect of entrepreneurship. But what we need to worry about is how to prevent this from happening on a regular basis or at least to stem the impact of this. Now to drive home the point, I was asked to be controversial, I believe, so you said I can push a bit, okay. So let me make this even more, more stark in comparison. This shows you over the period 1997 to 2005, two, two things are in this picture. The, Light, uh, I guess that's blue color, shows you after subtracting closings from, I'm sorry, closings from openings and subtracting, uh, so you get the net job change. You see that the jobs being added to the economy by startups over this period are always positive. Below that, you see the contribution that existing firms make. And what you see is that a couple of years, the existing firms, 1997, uh, 1984, 1995, and the last year was uh, year 2000, existing firms actually added more jobs than they, than they lost. But on balance, existing firms over this period were a drag on the economy. As the new jobs, the jobs being added to the economy were coming not from existing firms growing, they were coming from startups. And if it weren't for startups, let me say this again, if it weren't for startups over this period, for new firms 
three quarters of them autonomous firms. If it weren't for startups, eventually there'd be no jobs. Now that's an absurd image, isn't it? But technically, analytically speaking, that's true. If it weren't for startups, there would be no the jobs. Existing firms, on balance, are just there. One more picture to show you is how this happens. This is a picture showing you in the year, uh, this, this takes that period, 1992 to 2005, and, and says, let's, let's assume this is a cohort in the, in the year that the, these businesses, any, any year, 1992 to 2005, any year that they started, there were about 3 million jobs created by the startups. And then we say, what happened each year afterwards? First year cohort, second cohort, every year afterwards, what happened to the jobs in that cohort of firms? So we see after one year, the numbers of firms that add jobs and the number of firms that lost jobs pretty much balances out. And so there's, a, there's no real that change. But then as the years go by, as this set of firms started here, this set of firms continues to age, Every year that set of firms ages, on balance, it loses jobs. Let me repeat that. In any given year, we look at the startups. By definition, startups aren't going to lose jobs, so every any given year, the startups add jobs to the economy. Then those startup firms in the second year are no longer startups. They're aging firms. And every year after that, as those firms age, on balance, that set of firms loses jobs. Now some of them grow, that's true. Google is in there. Uh, Flickr is in there, Tumblr is in there. Foursquare, PayPal, they're all in there. So there are some firms that are growing, but they can't grow fast enough to offset all their peers who might have begun the same year that are losing jobs. So, you've heard this before, I'm sure you heard it today, but I wanted to show you, it is true. It is true. Entrepreneurs, startups in particular, drive job growth in an economy. Old industrial policy, the, the failed policies, the pre-war social democratic policies, the policies that some governments in Europe and the United States, mostly Europe, tried to enact in the 50s and 60s and 70s, saving jobs. Let's save jobs. Let's prop up existing industries. There's no point. What you're doing is just postponing, possibly at government expense, postponing the inevitable shrinkage of the job pool. Startups are the key Startups are the key to job creation and job growth in an economy. Now, I've shown you at this aggregate level, this is a very positive story. But remember the story I began with. Underlying this very aggregate positive story we should celebrate is the fact that as individuals, entrepreneurs face daunting challenges. Yes, if they succeed in starting, they contribute to the economy. But many of them will not do that. And that's the challenge we face in entrepreneurship. In the aggregate, we can celebrate the contribution entrepreneurs make. At the level of industries, we can pursue the innovations that would make it possible for the new industries to grow, to replace those industries that are declining. And find at the individual level, figure out what to do to offset the liability of newness. So, I just said that. Let me conclude with a couple of points. I'm an evolutionary theorist, so this is my kind of data which is I can look back from the present, and because I have a, the past to work with, I can be very smart. 
And I can, I can unequivocally, without fear of contradiction, say to you that over the last 15 years, job growth in the economy of capital societies was driven by startups. I can hope that this will be also true for the future, but of course I can't be sure. And that's the, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Yesterday at the university we were talking about some people's perceptions that entrepreneurs are concerned with risk. And I said, that's true nonsense. It's not true. Entrepreneurs are concerned with uncertainty. Risk is what bankers deal with. Risk is what insurance companies deal with. If you, if you can calculate risk, you can hedge it. You can really calculate risk. You can actually take out an insurance policy. Imagine an entrepreneurship insurance policy. You go to a company, you say, I'm starting a business in X industry. I would like some insurance, please, in case I fail. No. No, it's not, it's not about risk. It's about uncertainty. It's about coping with uncertainty. Entrepreneurs don't know what the future is going to hold for them. That liability of newness is there, that, that very, high, very high rate of exiting from the new venture population is there because of the uncertainty. These are very competent people, very capable people, but they're coping with uncertainty. By definition, the unknown. So we have to embrace this. Forget, let's stop talking about risk and, and looking at risk profile, risk preferences. Those are for bankers and insurance executives and politicians. But uncertainty is for entrepreneurs. And the other point I would make as an evolutionary theorist is to recognize we don't know what the future is going to bring. That's why it's very appropriate that uh, groups trying to promote entrepreneurship don't focus and center on just one opportunity or two or three or four. That's why it's important to have a portfolio. No one knows in a few years what the future will bring. I, my, uh, my oldest son is a serial entrepreneur, a serial executive entrepreneur, CEO entrepreneur. And he and I often talk about this, that if you look at the industries where he, he's, he's always been in high tech, he started one of the first dot-com companies back in 1995 in Silicon Valley. And we, we talk about looking back on what he's done and saying, you know, there's no way I knew what my future would hold. I was prepared for it, whatever it might bring. That's the difference, right? If people who claim clairvoyance actually try to tell you what you should do next, and try to say, this is the, this is the hot industry, this is the hot technology, right? this, is the, this is the hot area to invest in, uh, maybe, maybe not. But people who are competently prepared, good cognitive tools, solid understanding of organizational processes. When opportunities arise, when challenges arise, they'll meet them. That's what entrepreneurship is about. Thank you.